The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, the promise of jobs. Today I'm pleased to welcome India's preliminary agreement to purchase 10 C-17 cargo planes, which will support 22,000 jobs back in the United States. A presidential proclamation that may not be quite as advertised. Maybe if someone could tell me what new jobs they're creating with these orders for 10 airplanes, I'd like to know what they are. <laughs> and immigrants who came in search of the American dream now find the economy is better back home. No, I don't think that now is a good time to go to America. I don't think so. It's still a great country. <laughs> Plus, polling the public. Why do political surveys so often seem wrong? I mean, remember New Hampshire, where the polls thought Obama was going to win by 10 points, and he, he lost, you know, the next race in South Carolina. He was supposed to win by 10 points. He won by 30. I mean, it's a 20-point miss. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening. The task of standing up the American workforce has never been more important or more elusive. But to what length should the Obama administration go to secure jobs? We begin with an investigation into a trade deal the president recently announced that looks and sounds like a winner, especially for thousands of Americans who build giant airplanes for the U.S. military. Their jobs have been hanging by a thread. But the president's recent trip to India brought them hope when the White House brokered a billion-dollar agreement that could mean work for years, or so it was said. Tonight, we'll give you a look at the fine print. Will the trade deal actually save jobs, or is it just drumming up foreign business for big U.S. corporations? Now, before you can understand what's at stake, you need to have a feel of the people and the place that once drove the American aerospace industry. The skies over Long Beach, California, have been a frontier of American aviation for a hundred years. Around here, they know airplanes the way people in Detroit know cars. From the simplest single-engine planes to the marvels of modern military might, this seaside city in the Los Angeles basin has been the epicenter of an industry that helped fuel America's prosperity and security for generations. Tens of thousands of men and women have made their homes and raised their families building airplanes here in Long Beach. This was the place that aviation pioneer Donald Douglas turned into a hub of the arsenal of democracy during World War II. As these commemorative films show, the plant in Long Beach had 40,000 workers churning out wartime aircraft 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every two hours, a new B-17 bomber, C-47 transport, or A-20 attack plane rolled off the assembly line. Over the years, Douglas became McDonnell Douglas, which eventually became Boeing. This area was also home to aviation giants like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Hughes Aviation, as in Howard Hughes. At one time, one out of every 10 aviation jobs in the country was here in Los Angeles County, but not anymore. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The once proud aviation workforce has been decimated by a drumbeat of closures, shutdowns, downsizing, and outsourcing. And like good-paying blue-collar union manufacturing jobs in industries across the country, nobody thinks they're ever coming back. They just seem to be getting rid of everyone. I mean, at one time, we were well over 20,000 union people in that facility. If you drive by Lakewood and Carson today, you'll see where they're building all new buildings. That used to all be aircraft manufacturing. Ken Lindstrom has worked in the aviation manufacturing industry for 32 years. The planes he builds, the C-17 Globemaster III, 
are the only planes currently being produced in Long Beach, and Boeing is the only major aviation company still in operation here. As soon as this is gone, there will be no aerospace in Southern California. None. So we, we all know that once this program is done, we're done. It was not beyond the company's control. We don't believe the company bargained. Limstrom and his Boeing co-workers say they're proud of their work, and they have good reason. The C-17, according to Boeing spokesman Jerry Drelling, is the workhorse of the U.S. military. The C-17 is the last large, wide-body military aircraft being built, not just here in California, but across the U.S. This is a world-class workforce. The C-17 industrial base is uh, very valuable to the country. Should we stop production of this aircraft, essentially you would be uh, letting all these folks go. And if the Air Force decided that it needed airlift in the future, uh, it's very costly to reconstitute a program like this. Fire number three. The Globemaster, according to Drelling, moves our military in times of war and on missions of peace. There's no other aircraft in the world that can do what the C-17 can do. It can fly intercontinental with large loads, it can land on short, dirt, unimproved, austere runways. That means more than 100 troops or 170,000 pounds of cargo can be transported by a single plane to the most remote and dangerous areas of the world. Whether it's the mountains of Afghanistan, the whiteouts of Alaska, or the deserts of Iraq, the C-17 can get in and out fast. So if you're talking about humanitarian or disaster relief or equipment for troops, it makes it much easier and it saves a lot of lives that way. The C-17 is truly an all-American effort. As this graphic from Boeing shows, the only parts of the C-17 manufactured in Long Beach are these tiny sections in blue. The engines come from Connecticut. The nose assembly is from Missouri. The wing slants are made in Georgia. All in all, the C-17 is an assembly of parts that comes from more than 600 suppliers in 43 states. Having such a dispersed supply base was not accidental. That's what allowed Boeing to build a broad base of C-17 advocates in Washington. Advocates who voted to appropriate funds for new C-17s even when the military was saying it already had more than enough. The governor of the great state of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. A year ago, I got the bad news. I think there's a danger here that the federal government may not continue with our contract, that we maybe have to shut down our plant, that we discontinue building our C-17s. So we started a campaign. That campaign in 2006 helped convince Congress that saving the C-17 and the C-17 jobs was a matter of vital national security. This is not the time to mothball this program. It's the time to build more C-17s for the challenges that will come. Year after year, the Congress overruled the Pentagon's budget and ordered the planes themselves. The C-17 is what gives us the power to project overseas to fight the battle that protects us here at home. But shortly after taking office, President Obama and Secretary of Defense Robert Gates fought back, insisting that the country could no longer afford to buy $250 million planes it didn't need. Multiple studies in recent years show that the Air Force already has more of these aircraft than it needs. The administration the pressed Congress hard on the issue, often in public. Fighter. I am fully aware of the political pressure to continue building the C-17 and proceed with an alternate engine for the F-35. So let me be very clear. I will strongly recommend that the President veto any legislation that sustains the unnecessary continuation of these two programs. Secretary Gates' tough testimony, along with several studies about the military's airlift needs, put an end to earmarks for the C-17 last year. Drelling says once the Air Force takes delivery of aircraft number 223, it may very well be their last. All right, you're looking at uh, what we refer to as P-208. This will be the uh, U.S. Air Force's 208th C-17 when we deliver it. And that means the days of the C-17 line in Long Beach seem to be numbered. And back at the Union Hall, what was once an epic campaign to revive a time-honored industry in Long Beach, today has become merely a fight to save the few jobs that still exist. For this company to expect people to continue working 
when they don't know if they're going to have a job, whether they're going to be able to feed their family or have medical is just unacceptable, and we're going to take it on and do everything in our power to protect the members here at this hall. Like labor leaders of yesteryear, the union president, Stanley Klimchuk, continues to fight for workers and rail against management. And we're trying to prove them the rest of this Boeing uh, uh, numbskulls were having uh, uh, discussions with New Breed during negotiations. And but it's gotten so bad, union members are fighting each other. I'm in the same boat as you guys are. If you think I'm not upset about this, you got another thing coming. Well, yeah, but so it, you know what? It is you, what it is, Kenny. Say whatever you're going to say, but I'm you telling you, think I'm going to take this. About it, it's about time that you call the people that are bleeding this company, the leaders, the bleeders, the son of a bitches that they really are. That if we're going to stand and watch this building close, I get it. Nobody's this is a horrible, out. horrible, horrible time for us employees. But Kenny, I need your help, and it's better that we work together than uh, on this issue than to fight among each other. You led the charge on land. Like so many workers, Ken Lemstrom says he's angry because he's worried his job won't even last long enough to qualify him for the retirement benefits that he worked more than 30 years to earn. I have to have health care. I'm going to lose my health care. Yes, I take care of my parents, you know, because I, I have a father that's dying of cancer. My mom has MS and is going blind. Would I sell my house if it becomes necessary? Absolutely. Would I move out of California? Yes, I would. Because you, get, you, have, to, you have to go where you can survive at. And if I can't survive here, then I'll go somewhere else. But more than anything else, Lemstrom says he feels angry when he thinks about how much things have changed since the glory days, when California was the aviation capital of the world. I think the founder of Douglas, McDonnell, Boeing, Howard Hughes, I believe those guys are not just turning over in their grave. They're spinning like rotisserie chickens at what these people have done to their companies. It's all about profit, it's all about everything. These guys started these companies solely for flight. They wanted to make planes fly, and they loved their employees. That love is gone now. These guys, they have absolutely no integrity at all. When we return, the C-17 gets a new salesman. For 22,000 jobs. And a new overseas market. But how high is the price for a short stay of execution? That's next, so stay here with us. Tonight, we've been looking at a time not so long ago when the U.S. was far and away the global leader of the aerospace industry. The planes produced in America pushed the boundaries that allowed us to fly higher, faster, further. But the industry went global, and over the past 20 years, we've lost over half a million aerospace jobs. And here, in America's aviation mecca, the local economy has been pummeled. There are more than 30,000 people out of work all across Long Beach, California. The lines at the local job center are out the door. It was good news when the unemployment rate here finally dipped below 14% in December. In recent years, Long Beach has been rolling out efforts to diversify its economy, trying to offset the decline of aerospace. Its port is one of the busiest in the world, and the local tourism industry has been getting a big makeover. Boeing is still the city's biggest private employer, even though the Long Beach plant delivered its last commercial airplane, the Boeing 717, in 2006. It marked the end of a long, proud history of producing the airplanes you and I fly on every day. The 717 program is now at these final two steps of its life cycle with the delivery of the final two airplanes this morning. But Boeing executives told the workers that the Long Beach plant would rise again. We are dedicated to, to get putting more airplanes in here. Uh, the C-17 site, the Long Beach site, is, is one of the best ones that we have. Despite the promises, today Boeing's headcount is half of what it was a decade ago. The old commercial hangar still remains empty, 
and the plant is now hanging on by a single airplane, the C-17, the military workhorse whose days seem to be numbered. The Air Force already has more of these aircraft than it needs. When President Obama went to India last fall, a major item on the agenda was promoting trade deals as a way, it was said, to generate jobs back in the United States. He was accompanied by Jim McNerney, Jr., chair of the President's Export Council and the chief executive of Boeing. Strong U.S. government advocacy for American business in big competitive markets like India helps U.S. companies and U.S. employees in all size companies. A few days later, a deal is announced. Today I'm pleased to welcome India's preliminary agreement to purchase 10 C-17 cargo planes, which will enhance Indian capabilities and support 22,000 jobs back in the United States. It was billed as a good news story. But in order to broker this trade deal and others, the White House had to do some serious horse trading. The president agreed to remove India from the list of countries banned from buying U.S. technologies that could be put to military use. He also toned down his calls for anti-outsourcing legislation. The C-17 deal, according to a White House press release, would support Boeing's C-17 production facility in Long Beach, California for an entire year. In Long Beach, the news of the big win in India brought a collective sigh of relief. The plant was saved, at least for now. When they say they sell 10 planes, you figure, okay, that's one more year's work that we're gonna get. But Boeing workers like Ken Lindstrom say the relief quickly gave way to fury. A few weeks later, the company announced it would be cutting 150 union jobs and giving the work to a local non-union company. You know, while McNerney's over in India with President Obama talking about saving and creating jobs, we're being told back home, by the way, your job's going away. We're going to outsource it to somebody else. That's tough to swallow. He says the workers felt betrayed. For years, they thought they were on the same side as management, battling to save the C-17 and arguing that this was not only about saving jobs, it was also about preserving an industrial base vital to our national security. If business went down, they all took a hit, or so they believed. But now, Boeing had gotten new business and executives had decided that these seasoned workers weren't so vital and that laying them off could save the company some money. We've given them, well, for better lack of a better phrase, the best years of our lives, and now they want to throw us out in the cold. If the program was going away, we would totally understand that, but the program isn't. My motto is, if their mouth's moving, they're lying. But I also agree... I mean, we're, you take somebody that makes $30 an hour, that's $60,000 a year. That's not an exorbitant amount of money. Although our CEO makes between 14 and $19 million, I, I think he could have took a little haircut and kept us all employed. And we see India's emergence as good for the United States and good for the world. Lindstrom says that what's made the India deal even tougher to swallow is seeing his president boasting about creating good-paying jobs when he was actually doing far more to boost Boeing's bottom line. It's job creation policies like these that have left Lindstrom, a lifelong Democrat, a man now without a party. It all depends on which pocket you look in, which hand you, you know, whose hand you see in it. They're all taking money from big business. At one time, the Democratic Party was a party for the people. Now, you know, they're getting money from the same people and sharing the same pockets. You know, how can you sit with Jim McNerney in India and tout jobs and end up telling these people that we're going to outsource your job? It turned out there was even more bad news. Remember the excitement about those 22,000 jobs President Obama talked about? Well, it turns out there was some serious fine print. The deal did not promise to create 22,000 jobs or even create one new job. According to the White House, it would merely be, quote, supporting 22,000 jobs. In other words, preserving jobs that already exist. But not all the jobs. Last month, the company announced plans to cut 900 C-17 jobs in Long Beach. Boeing spokesman Jerry Drelling says without any new domestic orders, at least for now, 
the company has no choice but to reduce headcount. We are working very hard to keep this production line open, and we think that we can do it. The team here has worked incredibly hard to secure additional orders. I know it's a very frustrating and very painful time for everybody, and especially in the executive suite here, because, again, we never thought we'd be in this position. According to those in the executive suite, international sales are the last best hope for saving the C-17. But drilling says foreign orders tend to be small and take time to negotiate. If not for the India deal, which is still awaiting final government approvals, he says the line would shut down for good at the end of 2012. Now, it's slated to continue through 2013, but with staffing levels that he says are more affordable. This plant is not closing down, not by any stretch. And uh, We believe we can uh, build and, and deliver C-17s for many years to come, but we have to keep the C-17 affordable for domestic and international customers. And I am absolutely certain that the relationship between the United States and India is going to be one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Despite the applause in India, back in Long Beach, many worried that the trade deals President Obama was championing would lead to the same problems that helped kill the commercial airplane programs here. That's empty. That's Building 15. That's where they first developed the YC-15, which was the prototype for the C-17, but it was much smaller. And all this whole area was all uh, uh, manufacturing. Roy Crunk got his start in the aviation industry in 1966. He drove us around the Boeing plant in Long Beach where he worked for 39 years. When I hired in here, we built most of the parts for the airplanes. We built the galleys, the lavatories, uh, the baggage racks, the ceiling panels, sidewall panels. All those were done in buildings here, in these buildings. And then uh, little by little, they outsourced those jobs to other companies. In truth, much of what is called an American aircraft is now built overseas. The barrel sections were done in Italy. The nose is done in Korea. Uh, it's just all over the world. And they just sent them here, and we just put them together. We piece it together, and that's it. It's all part of perhaps the biggest factor eating away at America's once mighty manufacturing status, particularly in high-tech fields like aviation. In order to gain access to foreign markets, American businesses have had to make major concessions. These concessions are called offsets, agreements to move production or transfer technology overseas. And like most aerospace companies, Boeing's been doing it for years. In the mid-1980s, McDonnell Douglas, as the company was then known, entered into a deal to sell 26 MD-80 planes to China. The deal was the first of its kind. Crunk told us he was part of the team sent to China to do assembly training. China was assembling the airplanes. We would sell them these kit, sell them the airplane in kit form, and then we had people go over to show them how to put it all together. Yi. 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 Fast forward two decades to this scene. Amidst great fanfare, China unveils its first commercial airliner. And lo and behold, it looks remarkably familiar from tip to tail, a Chinese version of the American plane. For Kronk, watching China's ascent has been a cautionary tale, a tale he fears will be playing out again with the India deal. It's good for the company, they're gonna, they're gonna make more money. And the people who own stock in the company are going to make more money. So somebody's going to benefit from it. But as far as jobs are concerned, it's not creating any new jobs. I don't see any new jobs. Maybe if someone could tell me what new jobs they're creating with these orders for 10 airplanes, I'd like to know what they are. <laughs> Boeing's not talking much about bringing new aircraft programs to Long Beach that would create jobs these days let alone any new generation of aviation workers. But when we asked Boeing about their current offset agreements, they did have a lot to say about their future in India. In an email, they wrote that the company has $2.3 billion of offset commitments, which will be a, quote, catalyst to spur technology development and mutual job creation and to firmly establish India's position in the international aerospace supply chain. It might sound like a bunch of inspirational corporate speak, but to Ken Lindstrom, 
it spells bad news for his industry and his country. We're giving all these countries our technology, and pretty soon there won't be a Boeing. 20 years from now, I doubt Boeing will be building airplanes. You have Japan building their own, you have China building their own, you have Russia building their own, and they're more getting into being partners with these companies than they were competitor, than competitors. And they're giving away what made airplanes fly. And now we take you on a journey to the warmer climes of Brazil. While the American economy has been hammered of late, Brazil has been booming. Last year, the country enjoyed a 7.5% growth rate, a pace that would be the envy of anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Prices are surging. Office space in Rio is now more expensive than New York. But we're going to take you off the beaten path tonight to the city you probably haven't heard of, Governador Valadares. It's about 600 miles north of Rio, and it's one of the few places in Brazil that's actually suffering, mostly because of its strong connection to a place that has long been a lifeline, the United States. It was an entire city powered by dollars an economy fueled with the overseas incomes of thousands of its citizens who immigrated to the United States for what they call Fazer America, or Doing America. Of course, immigrants come to the U.S. from all over Brazil, but in the city of Governador Valadares, immigration takes place on an entirely different scale. Most go illegally, so nobody knows the exact numbers. But in this city of about 300,000 people, fully 50% of all households have sent someone to the United States. Em Valadares, a imigração correspondeu a uma indústria que abastecia Valadares com milhões de dólares a cada mês. Jair Batista is the city's secretary of urban planning. Para nós é difícil imaginar a cidade sem Framingham, sem Boston, sem... Nós falamos desses lugares como se fossem parte de Valadares. Não há família aqui que não tem alguém nos Estados Unidos. He might be exaggerating, but not by much. During our visit to City Hall, Batista took us along for a quick survey of his co-workers. Cristina tem quase toda a família nos Estados Unidos. O Valdir tem os primos nos Estados Unidos. Bruno teve os tios nos Estados Unidos, já retornaram. In office after office. Você tem uma irmã, um irmão. Nearly everyone we met. Tem dois Nova York e o resto é de Boston. Had family in the United States. Primos. Primos. Porque ele mesmo determinou quando voltar. Foi preso. Foi preso. Foi preso e deportado. Preso por ser ilegal. Exatamente. É, é praticamente todo mundo, não tem? And it wasn't just here. Everywhere we turned, we met people who had once worked in the United States at the front desk of the hotel. Que eu ganhei lá, eu não conseguiria aqui em 10, 15 anos. Eu ganhei em 3 anos. At the parking garage. Eu morei em Bridgeport, Connecticut. Muito brasileiro lá. Muito brasileiro. There's even a funeral home in town that broadcasts over the internet for immigrants who can't make it home when a loved one dies. Poder assistir lá é como se eles estivessem, de, de certa forma, participando do momento. This local hamburger joint is actually called America. And its owner, not surprisingly, has been there too. If I have two lives, the other one will be America. <laughs> For sure. I would like to be American. No other, no other life. And live in Florida. Ricardo Guerra worked in the U.S. for three years, and his entire restaurant is a kind of tribute to his experience there. I was thinking about American places, the American yacht that have uh, the, the house in America that has grass in front. I love that. 
But why does this out-of-the-way town in southern Brazil have such a special relationship with the United States? Sueli Sequeira is a sociologist at Vale do Rio Doce University and has studied immigration patterns in Valadares for years. She's traced the links between her city and the United States all the way back to the Second World War. The U.S. government desperately needed the iron ore and mica found in these mineral-rich hills to sustain the war effort. An American company was charged with building a railroad to speed the vital cargo to the coast. One side effect was economic growth for Valadares. Então foi um período em que a imagem dos americanos representava uma, uma imagem de desenvolvimento. Então isso ficou no imaginário popular essa ideia de, né, os Estados Unidos um país de muita riqueza. After the war, an American railroad executive named Richard Simpson stayed behind. His house still stands on a wooded hilltop overlooking the city. Together with his wife, Simpson started an English language school, and it was from there as exchange students that the first pioneers from Valadares headed for the United States in the 1960s. In the local papers, stories about the exchange students were front page news. Trouxeram a notícia de que era um país muito, né, rico. Eles levavam mais de 20, mais 30 cada um deles receberam em suas casas. Então aí você tem, começa o que a gente chama de, de forma a, a chamada rede de imigração. In the 1980s, this immigration network became a lifeline for Valadares. Brazil was mired in an economic crisis with crushing public debt and hyperinflation that sometimes exceeded 2,000%. I cannot explain to American people what hyperinflation is. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. Many things like a mineral oil could, could, buy, could cost like one million Cruzeiros or something like that. It's unbelievable. A friend of mine from Valadares was calling me and said, Let's come here, they're going to have more valuable job here, you know. You're good mechanics. Said, okay, I'm going to try it. That's why I went to America. Jose Alberto Costa went to Boston in 1987. When a friend introduced him to the owner of an auto repair shop, he was hired on the spot. I was good mechanic, cars, go to garage, five, six garages, different garages, nobody can fix. They was bringing it to me, that's why you was paying me good money. In 1989, I was making about $1,200 a week. The good money was even better when he sent it back home. In those days, the dollar towered over Brazil's currency. In the era of the 80s, the dollar was 3 por um. Então, em um, em um dia de trabalho, lá eles ganhavam o que ganhava aqui em um mês. Então, era muito dinheiro. The immigration boom was on. In the 1980s and 90s, tens of thousands headed for the states, sending millions of dollars back to their families. Throughout Brazil, Valadares became known as Valadollars. Enquanto o Brasil inteiro vivia uma crise na economia, na construção civil, Valadares crescia. Tá? As, os prédios se elevavam, tá? é, o comércio era um comércio efervescente. Some people amassed hundreds of thousands of dollars in property and savings during their time in America. Quanto dinheiro que conseguiu poupar nesses 20 anos de América? Well, that time was, like I say, was make good money and uh, bought a house. About half a million dollars. Not everybody made that kind of money, and most immigrants from Valadares went through a lot to get their dollars. They lived in austerity and worked punishingly long days at multiple jobs. And while Valadares was living high on the hog from the influx of dollars, it was neglecting its future. Batista, the city planner, says that in the last decade, the city created just a fraction of the jobs it needed. Outros lugares do Brasil se industrializaram, construíram universidades, buscaram alternativas. Valadares não buscou alternativa durante todo aquele tempo. 
In the early 2000s, the city's fortunes started to change. Because of Brazil's growing economy and strengthening currency, the dollars that Valadares depended on started to lose their value. But the real blow came when the U.S. financial crisis hit and the money from America dried up. The financial drought has had a visible impact on the city. This housing development on the edge of town was started 10 years ago. It's not hard to guess where the money came from. The real estate agent here told us that they even used to have a sales representative based in the United States. Now, most owners can't afford to build houses on the lots they bought. The properties lie vacant or half-built, like thousands of similar properties throughout Valadares. And instead of dollars flowing into the city, there is now a human wave of returning immigrants. Many lost their homes or businesses in the U.S. Others found themselves unable to earn back the thousands of dollars they paid to get to the U.S. illegally. Still others were deported as immigration authorities cracked down in recent years. Instead of finding their American dream, these Brazilians have been forced to make a painful return home. And even for people who came back flush, it's clear that the glory days are over. Nobody talk about dollars anymore. The last time I saw a dollar was the time I came from America. Costa, the man who told us he made half a million dollars during his time in the U.S., wouldn't advise anyone to go there now. Why are they going to leave Brazil to go to America? It's not worth it. So if I go over there, I make five, six hundred dollars a week. How am I going to support the family with this money? Instead, Costa has used some of his savings to open an auto shop of his own. And he says business is good. He makes about $1,000 a week, almost what he made in America in the 80s. But here, he does it without working his fingers to the bone. I can go play my sock with my family, drink the beers with my, my, my friends, go fishing. You know what I mean? We don't have a lot of money here, but we live a, a life like a king. <laughs> Spend some time in Valadares, and it's impossible not to notice the economic progress sweeping Brazil. Inflation is under control. Unemployment is at a record low, and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. Head to the shopping district downtown, and you can see that products once considered luxury items are now within reach of Brazil's burgeoning middle class. I don't think that now is a good time to go to America. I don't think so. Still a great country. <laughs> At Ricardo Guerra's America restaurant, you can still walk up to almost any table and meet someone who has family in the U.S. But you can also see the evidence of Brazil's new prosperity. People that make a, a, the minimal rate, minimal salary, and uh, he now can afford to come to a, a place like this. He can drink a beer, he can uh, uh, have a sandwich, and even a pizza with his family. On many nights, the dinner rush doesn't let up until after midnight. Guerra jokes that to keep up, they also have to work like Americans. But it seems that the U.S. has lost some of its luster for Guerra. He was once so captivated by America that he named his restaurant after it. Now, he's eager to talk about his own country's bright future. We have uh, energy, we have food, we have uh, beaches for tourists. We have many things that are not explored yet. We are starting to explore. So I think that Brazil will be one of the best places in the world very soon, I think so. Welcome back. It may seem that we just rang in the new year, but when it comes to the calendar of presidential politics, we'll be in 2012 before you know it. This is when the field of candidates starts to take shape. So we felt that it would be a good time to sit down with our old friend and poll-watching guru, Nate Silver. 
Nate now works for the New York Times, and after a busy 2010, he's turning his attention to the lead-up to the next election. Let's talk politics. We we'll always like to talk sure. politics. <laughs> uh, it's coming up. It's always it's always shorter than you think. You know, it always kind of. Well, I sort of say still early, but not that early. Looking toward 2012, um, a lot of people are sort of nibbling around the edges, playing coy about whether they're going to run or not. When should we start paying attention for real? Uh, who's in and who's out? Well, in some ways, I mean, it's been surprising that we, we haven't had very many candidates or any kind of major candidates declare yet. You know, by this point, um, four years ago, you know, essentially everyone had had declared. And I think, you know, it made, made sense before or after, you know, people didn't want to kind of, Republicans didn't want to stomp on their momentum heading into November when they did very well. But I'm surprised that you haven't had someone, be it a kind of Romney or a Pawlenty, be like, look, you know, uh, you know, let's get out in front of this and kind of get some publicity. Well, let's play the game. We always start by saying it's illegal to wager on political races <laughs> in the United States of America. Uh, but let's go down the, the, the list and the supposed list. Tell me what you think uh, for the Republicans. Sure. Well, you know, I mean, Mitt Romney is kind of the purported <laughs> front runner, I suppose. And in some ways, I think, you know, people might not appreciate his kind of behind the scenes advantage, right? I mean, maybe the package, it's kind of slick and whatever. Maybe there's some issues with his support of kind of Romney care in Massachusetts, but he does, he does the things like fundraising very well, you know, but he's someone who I think would almost, the, the kind of longer the race goes because he's an acceptable choice to most Republicans, the better off he is in some ways. You know, I don't know if he's likely to, to steamroll through the field. Um, you know, Iowa might be somewhat difficult for him if you have a conservative candidate who catches fire like Huckabee did in 2008. Um, but Huckabee you know, have a chance? I think Huckabee is kind of uh, like criminally underrated <laughs> by a lot of people. I mean, if, if you survey Republicans and say, do you like this person or not, he has the best favorability numbers, where almost everyone likes him, very few people dislike him. Some people might not be, you know, they might not be his first choice for some people. People who are, you know, fiscal conservatives, for instance, might think he's a little bit soft on on taxes and so forth, um, and he's not the most telegenic guy necessarily, right? But he's he's a nice guy, and that can count for a lot, right? Oh, so we have much. Romney and, and Huckabee. Palin? I don't know. I mean, you know, if you look at the polls, right, then she's kind of right up there. But there are a lot of polls saying if Palin were nominated, she would lose to Obama by 15 or, or 20 points, and I see no particular reason <laughs> to doubt that. She's someone who is known and who is not very well liked. Her favorability ratings are low in the 30s with, with kind of, you know, independent voters. Um, at some point, I think Republicans are going to say, look, I'm not willing to take <laughs> that chance. If you want someone who's a cons not someone who's a pure conservative, we can find someone else in her place. But, but I don't know. You know, I mean, there are still scenarios where she could, she could win. I mean, she certainly has some enthusiastic support. If it turns out that you have you know, for example, two moderate candidates splitting that vote, and she's kind of the conservative candidate she oh, could win. If she wins Iowa, which is a good state for her in some ways with the evangelical vote, um, you know, she just kind of could, could get a lot of momentum. She does have a, a hard core of people. Her she overall does. positive ratings, likability ratings are not that high. But with the, the rock core of the Republican Party, she's standing pretty high. You talked about, well, some of the more, we'll describe them as moderate candidates, could split the vote. Could you or could you not see a dynamic developing in which she becomes the winner of the Republican nomination, but then in a general election, a la Goldwater against Johnson, let's say, in 1964? Sure. Is that a, is that a possibility? Well, anything's a possibility. Oh, sure, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, if you just kind of look at it and say, okay, we don't know that much about what the conditions will be of the economy, for example, in November. 2012, but you know, there is a, if just kind of as an actuary, you're kind of a handicapper, right? I mean, there's a chance that Obama will win by a landslide margin. That's not that uncommon when someone's running for their second term, in part because sometimes the other party nominates yeah, Reagan in 1984, for example. Yeah, carried, Reagan or Nixon second 49 term. States, or, you know, yeah. LB, I mean, you know, it's not at all uncommon for a, <laughs> for a candidate. Even, you know, even Clinton won by a not overwhelming, but very, very solid margin, you know, and his approval ratings. Um, were lower than Obama's were at this point kind of, you know, going into, into, you know, 1996. Well, let's talk about somebody, quote, coming out of nowhere, a lesser known candidate, say, uh, uh, former Governor Huntsman. Sure. Uh, from out west. 
uh, he's obviously testing the waters, or the governor of Minnesota, Pawlenty. Who do you see as a, maybe the strongest possibility of coming from way in the back of the pack or on the fringes and become a major factor? Well, you know, I, I think someone needs some kind of personality to do that. So to give an example, someone like Chris Christie, who's the governor of New Jersey, who has a lot of panache and kind of panache and kind of stands out and, you know, makes a name for himself. I mean, that's the kind of skill set you think you would need um, to break through a field where you do have these brand names, flawed candidates, but brand names like Palin and, and Romney and, and so forth. Well, let's talk about polls, something you know a lot about. You watch polls, you conduct polls, you crunch the numbers. Uh, you were very critical of posters during the, the last presidential campaign, going far at one point saying they were, quote, biased, and you thought, uh, in many cases, inaccurate. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, I mean, you know, all we're doing is we're actually scoring how well the pollsters, the pollsters do, you know, and kind of one measure is how accurate you are, you know. I mean, the average pollster missed the average race by about four points, you know, in a race for Senate, for example, which isn't, which isn't bad, um, you know, but some miss by more than that. And some, when they miss, it's always to the same side. Like Rasmussen reports, for example, is, you know, run by a guy, Scott Rasmussen, who's, you know, a conservative and a Republican, and that's fine. I mean, a lot of people can have, you know, it's, there's no crime in having an opinion and also kind of running a polling agency. But lo and behold, you know, <laughs> his numbers lean toward the Republicans, you know, every, everywhere from, you know, a year in advance of the campaign to the final November 2nd, right? And, you know, lo and behold, they, they missed pretty badly. They were, you know, as well as Republicans did, um, he had them doing a lot better than they actually did and kind of, you know, he had a kind of two or three point bias toward Republican candidates and that's, that's quite, you know, and it's, it's, you know, there's no way to deny it. I mean, you have the numbers and it's public information and so we just kind of say, okay, we're just going to look at all the polls. Help the viewer out here and for that matter, help <laughs> this aging reporter out. <laughs> How should we view polls? Should you ignore them? Should you say, well, it's way too early? Should you say they don't amount to much? How should we view polls? I, you know, as skeptically as you want to, I think, is, <laughs> is a good kind of general piece of advice. I mean, certainly as far as looking at things like, like 2012 matchups right now, um, there's not a whole lot of reason to pay attention to polls, you know. Um, I mean, you know, Ronald Reagan at this point was favored to lose to Jimmy Carter by 25 points <laughs> or something, you know. It's way too early to say very much about um, 2012. You can tell some things. I mean, you know, I think when pollsters say that Sarah Palin, for example, is, is unpopular with independent voters, there's no reason to doubt that or to think that will particularly change. Um, but, you know, even when you do get to elections, sometimes polls make big mistakes. And remember, in general elections, polls aren't, aren't too bad, right? Um, but in primaries, they can be really awful. We're gonna have the primaries before the general election. I mean, remember, New Hampshire, where the polls thought Obama was going to win by <laughs> 10 points, and he, he lost, you know, likewise. I mean, there were a lot of states where, you know, the next race in South Carolina, he was supposed to win by 10 points, he won by 30. I mean, that's a 20-point miss. So polls and primaries are, are pretty poor. What can be done to improve polls, or can anything be done? I think pollsters know the right way to do things if they want, and that means, you know, you actually make an effort to have a higher response rate. I mean, right now, about... 25% of Americans um, don't even have landlines. They rely only on their cell phones, and some pollsters don't call them at all. You know, the idea that you're taking a scientific sample where you exclude, you know, 25% of the population right from the get-go is really alarming to me. And as we approach 2012, it's clear that there's going to be a blizzard of things written on the internet, sure. on 24-hour cable, all of that. Uh, to what should we be paying the most attention? I think, frankly, just looking at Obama's approval rating is still maybe the most, the single best metric, where I think I'd rather look at an Obama approval poll and see this hypothetical of, of you know, say how he would do against a Mitt Romney or something, because the Mitt Romney that you would have after he emerges from the primaries will be very, a very different candidate than the one that people perceive right now. So I'm going to ask you to guess. You guess that Sarah Palin gets in or doesn't get in? I would think she would get in if I, you know, if you had to kind of make a 50-50 bet, um, in part because I think that to some extent, I think her brand will get stale. Um, and I think to some extent her brand is driven now kind of maybe more by liberals who like to <laughs> hate her, right? Liberals who like, oh, you know, I mean, you can, hey, you know, if you write 
a Sarah Palin column or you're producing a TV segment. I mean, Sarah Palin kind of sells papers, right? But to some extent, I think it might be being driven more by people kind of making fun of her um, than by real enthusiasm. And if that becomes the case, then, you know, at some point, you're not viable. I mean, I think she has to, you know, I think she can't just kind of drift in the wind for for four more years. She's got to kind of cash in on her on her brand now. Nate, thank you much. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Of course. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> thank you. Nate Silver, formerly of 538.com, now on the New York Times website. And that's our report for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net. course of the U.S. military. The C-17 is the last large, wide-body military aircraft being built, not just here in California, but across the U.S. This is a world-class workforce. The C-17 industrial base is uh, very valuable to the country. Should we stop production of this aircraft, essentially you would be uh, letting all these folks go. And if the Air Force decided that it needed airlift in the future, uh, it's very costly to reconstitute a program like this. Fire number three. The Globemaster, according to Drelling, moves our military in times of war and on missions of peace. There's no other aircraft in the world that can do what the C-17 can do. It can fly intercontinental with large loads, can land on short, dirt, unimproved, austere runways. That means more than 100 troops or 170,000 pounds of cargo can be transported by a single plane to the most remote and dangerous areas of the world whether it's the mountains of Afghanistan, the whiteouts of Alaska, or the deserts of Iraq, the C-17 can get in and out fast. So if you're talking about humanitarian or disaster relief or equipment for troops, it makes it much easier and it saves a lot of lives that way. The C-17 is truly an all-American effort. As this graphic from Boeing shows, the only parts of the C-17 manufactured in Long Beach are these tiny sections in blue. The engines come from Connecticut. The nose assembly is from Missouri. The wing slants are made in Georgia. All in all, the C-17 is an assembly of parts that comes from more than 600 suppliers in 43 states. Having such a dispersed supply base was not accidental. That's what The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, the promise of jobs. Today I'm pleased to welcome India's preliminary agreement to purchase 10 C-17 cargo planes, which will support 22,000 jobs back in the United States. A presidential proclamation that may not be quite as advertised. Maybe if someone could tell me what new jobs they're creating with these orders for 10 airplanes, I'd like to know what they are. <laughs> and immigrants who came in search of the American dream now find the economy is better back home. Now, I don't think that now is a good time to go to America. I don't think so. It's still a great country. <laughs> Plus, polling the public. Why do political surveys so often seem wrong? I mean, remember New Hampshire, where the polls thought Obama was going to win by 10 points, and he, he lost, you know, the next race in South Carolina. He was supposed to win by 10 points. He won by 30. I mean, it's a 20-point miss. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report.
Good evening. The task of standing up the American workforce has never been more important or more elusive. But to what length should the Obama administration go to secure jobs? We begin with an investigation into a C-47 transport or A-20 attack plane rolled off the assembly line. Over the years, Douglas became McDonnell Douglas, which eventually became Boeing. This area was also home to aviation giants like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Hughes Aviation, as in Howard Hughes. At one time, one out of every 10 aviation jobs in the country was here in Los Angeles County, but not anymore. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The once proud aviation workforce has been decimated by a drumbeat of closures, shutdowns, downsizing, and outsourcing. Okay, if everybody could remain standing. And like good paying blue collar union manufacturing jobs in industries across the country, Nobody thinks they're ever coming back. They just seem to be getting rid of everyone. I mean, at one time, we were well over 20,000 union people in that facility. If you drive by Lakewood and Carson today, you'll see where they're building all new buildings. That used to all be aircraft manufacturing. Ken Lindstrom has worked in the aviation manufacturing industry for 32 years. The planes he builds, the C-17 Globemaster III, are the only planes currently being produced in Long Beach, and Boeing is the only major aviation company still in operation here. As soon as this is gone, there will be no aerospace in Southern California, none. So we, we all know that once this program is done, we're done. It was not beyond the company's control. We don't believe the company bargained. Limstrom and his Boeing co-workers say they're proud of their work, and they have good reason. The C-17, according to Boeing spokesman Jerry Drelling, is the world trade deal the president recently announced that looks and sounds like a winner, especially for thousands of Americans who build giant airplanes for the U.S. military. Their jobs have been hanging by a thread, but the president's recent trip to India brought them hope when the White House brokered a billion-dollar agreement that could mean work for years, or so it was said. Tonight we'll give you a look at the fine print. Will the trade deal actually save jobs, or is it just drumming up foreign business for big U.S. corporations? Now, before you can understand what's at stake, you need to have a feel of the people in the place that once drove the American aerospace industry. The skies over Long Beach, California, have been a frontier of American aviation for a hundred years. Around here, they know airplanes the way people in Detroit know cars. From the simplest single-engine planes to the marvels of modern military might, this seaside city in the Los Angeles basin has been the epicenter of an industry that helped fuel America's prosperity and security for generations. Tens of thousands of men and women have made their homes and raised their families building airplanes here in Long Beach. This was the place that aviation pioneer Donald Douglas turned into a hub of the arsenal of democracy during World War II. As these commemorative films show, the plant in Long Beach had 40,000 workers churning out wartime aircraft 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every two hours, a new B-17 bomber allowed Boeing to build a broad base of C-17 advocates in Washington. Advocates who voted to appropriate funds for new C-17s, even when the military was saying it already had more than enough. The governor of the great state of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. A year ago, I got the bad news. I think there's a danger here that the federal government may not continue with our contract, that we maybe have to shut down our plant, that we discontinue building our C-17s. So we started a campaign. That campaign in 2006 helped convince Congress that saving the C-17 and the C-17 jobs was a matter of vital national security. This is not the time 
to mothball this program. It's the time to build more C-17s for the challenges that will come. Year after year, Congress overruled the Pentagon's budget and ordered the planes themselves. The C-17 is what gives us the power to project overseas to fight the battle that protects us here at home. But shortly after taking office, President Obama and Secretary of Defense Robert Gates fought back insisting that the country could no longer afford to buy $250 million planes it didn't need. Multiple studies in recent years show that the Air Force already has more of these aircraft than it needs. The administration the pressed Congress hard on the issue, often in public. I am fully aware of the political pressure to continue building the C-17 and proceed with an alternate engine for the F-35. So let me be very clear. I will strongly recommend that the President veto any legislation that sustains the unnecessary continuation of these two programs. Secretary Gates' tough testimony, along with